this means that this balancing force is engineerable. That means it's possible to do a type of vibrational engineering with these energies. This is the exact same vibratory energy as what you see around the heads or the bodies of the saints in every tradition. It's not a metaphor. It's an actual vibrational force. There are ways this can be engineered and activated, and they use this all the time in the ancient world. They could use it for many things from powerful spiritual activations to profound healing to projecting extremely toxic and deadly vibrations. That unless you're trained in an energetic science like Chinese medicine, a Western medical doctor will never even know what happened to the person because they won't see the blockages that it creates. They won't see the effects on the energy flows. So when I began to work with vibrational teachings and methods of different traditions all over the world, which I was able to focus on during the 12 years that I spent at the university getting my doctorate in international studies, there's always a challenge because different traditions will look at the vibrational realities around us, the vibrations that affect human consciousness, that affect our thoughts, our feelings, as well as our energy system every moment of every day, They'll analyze these through different methods. There's a concept that I refer to as the number prism, that to understand any phenomena, what we do in a modern scientific approach is we divide it into its component parts. And so what you'll find in India, for example, to understand healing vibrations, they tend to divide them into three different parts. And they'll talk about the three gunas. They'll talk about vata and pitta and kapha. They use a threefold division. In the West, there'd often be a fourfold division of the four elements. In China, a fivefold division of the five elements. To fully understand any system in the world and to be able to differentiate out every one of its core aspects requires, at minimum, a twelve-fold division. This is a classical teaching from great spiritual and healing traditions in the world. That's why there are twelve disciples around the Christ why there are 12 Imams in Shia Islam, while there are a division of the stars into 12 signs of the zodiac around the sun. It's 12 around the one. For those of you that know sacred geometry, and you look at how a cube is structured, a cube is the form that gives rise to matter. The cube has 12 lines that define the cube. If you look at a sphere, you can fit exactly 12 spheres around a central sphere. Again, 12 around the one. So. To lead to the discussion directly of this, I want to give a frame of reference of what we have done to create modern technology. Because sometimes we take for granted that we live in an age of technological miracles. We just are so exposed to it every day, we don't think about it anymore. But the world has been completely transformed in the last 100 years through discoveries that have taken place over the last 150 years. Now, what I'm referring to here is that to have a science, you need to be able to differentiate any aspect of things into its component parts. You need to have a spectrum, what we would call spectrum analysis. So one of the first breakthroughs that we had was the identification of every type of matter that exists in the physical world. In the ancient world, you never had that. So we live in a material world, but we didn't know what all the different pieces of matter were until the latter part of the 1800s with the identification of the periodic table of elements. What is the, we call the periodic table of elements is really the identification of the complete spectrum of matter itself. That opened up everything in material science for all of our modern technology. But then there was another breakthrough that took place in the late 1800s and then was finalized in the year 1932. And that was identifying the complete spectrum of electromagnetic energy. Because until 1932, with the identification of microwaves, we didn't have an understanding of the complete spectrum of electromagnetic energies. So what you find in many classical traditions is that they will talk about different levels of creation. So there's the physical level. There is the etheric life energy level. That in China would be called qi. Or in Japan would be called ki. Or in India would be called prana. Greeks would call it the ether. So this etheric vital force energy is above that of the physical. Then there are consciousness levels beginning with what we call in the West the astral level. Well, with all these different levels, we have to understand a progression that is taking place in modern science. People don't properly understand what electromagnetic energy is. 
Because time and time again, in subtle energy research in modern times, things dealing with etheric life force, with chi, we try to get validity from modern science by saying the li vital life force is electromagnetic. Electromagnetic energy is not the vital life force. If it was, you could plug the base of your spine into an electrical outlet and get charged up. But it doesn't work that way. In fact, as we'll describe later tonight, there's a vibrational component in electromagnetic energy that is extremely toxic. And that's why people get electrosensitivity and have detrimental effects from electrical fields. What the vital life force is that's above the level of the physical, in every classical tradition, they understood that this vital life force is what went into the physical and animated it. It's the animating power. So when we understand that, we'll understand that when that power has animated the physical body through what the Chinese call the universal qi field or what the Greeks would call the ether, that animation process creates resistance passing through the conductor of the human body, passing through the conductor of physical materials, and that means that this faster than light energy slows way down. And this particular energy from the ether begins to decay. The decay of the etheric energy, of the vital force energy, is what we call electromagnetic energy. That's why Nikola Tesla, in his work, said, well, today in technology, we worked with retarded Hertzian waves that are slower than light. But Tesla, in the 1890s, said there's another type of wave, scalar waves, that are faster than light. And that's the real thing behind the electromagnetic energy. So for what I'm about to describe to you, the concept is then that our electromagnetic energy is in fact decayed life force. It's the decayed vital energy that animates living beings. But it became a shadow substance in electromagnetic energy. Now it becomes gross enough, it becomes dense enough, that we can use it to do things like turn a physical motor and create our modern technology. Hard to do that with the ether. You can animate a living being. And it's said that some traditions have been able to harness the ether to be able to turn motors. And there's a lot of work going on in this field today in things like the Tesla Society. But that gross level of the energy and electromagnetic energy is what we use in modern technology. So the discovery of this vibrational spectrum of all the subtle energies that are too subtle to be picked up by electromagnetic equipment began to take place in the 1930s in France. One of the major researchers was a radio wave engineer named Louis Turin. And Louis Turin had studied French radiesthesia, the method of being able to pick up subtle vibrations through the use of particular types of pendulums or other tools. Now the difficulty we have today is that their method has almost nothing to do with what you see today with the use of pendulums and mental dowsing. It's a completely different method. In this work, they don't ask any mental questions. They don't program the pendulum mentally ahead of time for movement. Rather, the pendulums have particular types of angles or shapes built into them that resonate with a particular vibrational force, or they can be tuned to a series of different vibrations. Then through the movement of the pendulum or other type of measurement tool, you'll then be able to perceive simply the presence or the absence of an invisible vibration that most people cannot perceive. Some people who are very sensitive energy healers or psychics may be able to perceive some of these energies. But what the tool allows you to do is then to pick up that vibratory force coming from any person, place, or thing. So with the work of Louis Turin, as a radio wave engineer, he understood that there are all types of waves that are passing through us all the time that you'll have no idea even exist unless you have a tool to be able to detect it. So he knew from radio wave technology, radio waves are passing through things all the time. You don't know they're there until you use a crystal and you tune the crystal to pick up the broadcast. So using the concepts of the French radiesthesia, which I won't go into too much of the background tonight, but let's just say it goes back to ancient times, goes back to the ancient Egyptian temple science, goes back to the work of the Jesuits in the uh, Catholic tradition. And this is not some conspiracy theory. This is actually coming from writings of Jesuit-trained French priests who wrote in French in the early 1900s and who wrote books about this. Then came into France, was given out to the public as an actual method to detect subtle vibrations, and then was taken further by people like Louis Turin. This was a gigantic development in subtle energy work. 
to be able to differentiate the complete spectrum of all subtle energies into 12 parts. This then gave us a 12-fold spectrum with the color bands associated with it. Now here's the thing. These 12 vibrations that make up the complete spectrum of subtle energy the exact same way that the electromagnetic spectrum shows the complete spectrum of electromagnetic energy, these energies were described for simplicity by the French in terms of colors. Because all of these subtle vibrations, they may be completely invisible, or that vibration can appear in any quality scale. What do I mean by a quality scale? A quality scale is shape, or sound, or movement, or angle, or color, or proportion. All of these are qualities. There are healers who use only light and color. There are healers who use only sound. There's healers that use only angles. There are healers that use only numbers. All of these are quality scales to express the complete spectrum of vibrational forces. But I want to mention that how I found out about this in the first place was through my dear friend and mentor, Dr. Ibrahim Karim from Cairo, Egypt. So Dr. Karim built another system on top of the French identification of the vibrational spectrum. Now with Dr. Karim's work, what he did is that he not only worked with the 12 bands of all the different powers or qualities of energy that exist with subtle energy, but he asked a very important question. In the French work, when you look at this particular spectrum, again, bear in mind that though it's expressed as color, color is only one way that invisible vibration could manifest. It could stay completely invisible to normal human senses, or it could manifest as a sound, as a shape, etc. That's why you see all of these medieval texts talking about correspondences. This sound equals this color, which equals this shape, which equals this string length, etc. So in the French work, they talked about the way that the 12 vibrations will form around the boundary of objects. You can actually test them there directly. And then certain people, places, things, shapes, would manifest a very specific vibration. They called it the shape-caused wave. It's a vibratory wave that comes from a shape. Now, Dr. Kareem did a tremendous amount of work with this because he's an architect. He wanted to understand exactly what vibratory forces am I getting from shapes and how do they affect living beings. But he did something else the French hadn't thought to do, a brilliant act of lateral thinking. And that is, just as you have the 12 bands of all the vibrations that appear on the perimeter of all objects, he asked, well, what's the energy in the center of everything? What's in the center of every chakra in the human body? What's in the center of every shape, of every form, of any material? So the center of everything, any form, if you draw a circle, it will appear at the moment you draw the circle in the center of the circle. Now that appears strange to us. We don't think about natural forces interacting with our creative activity in this way, but it does. As soon as you learn to detect, detect these energies, you'll be able to create any shape or test any existing shape, whether in 2D or 3D, and see exactly where this force manifests. This means that this balancing force, just like all the rest of the vibrational spectrum, is engineerable. That means it's possible to do a type of vibrational engineering with these energies. So Dr. Kareem, in asking the question, what's that energy in the center? He identified that one of the three energies is what he called the higher harmonic of gold. This is the exact same vibratory energy as what you see around the heads or the bodies of the saints in every tradition. It's not a metaphor. It's an actual vibrational force. There are ways this can be engineered and activated, and they use this all the time in the ancient world. So the French in their work in the 1930s identified the way that the 12 bands of vibration that they had detected, which are all of the polarized energies in the world, all the things that create one specific power, it's hot versus cold, it's light versus dark. These different specialized powers of the 12 then correspond with what Dr. Kareem found with the one quality in the center, the centering vibration, which has no opposite. It's the connection to the original unified source. It's unity. And what we have then is an exquisite system in which that energy of unity in the center then manifests into physical space and specific activity by taking on energies of specific bands of the 12 bands. Dr. Kareem advanced this work so far that by the early 1990s in Egypt, certain people in the Egyptian government knew about his work. And they invited him to demonstrate the power of these vibrations coming from shapes, coming from geometry, 
at the Egyptian National Research Center. This then led to Dr. Karim successfully demonstrating that he could affect the life functions in living beings through pure shapes. So for example, he put one geometric form over a fast replicating cell culture, left another alone, and showed that the one left alone would replicate normally very fast replication of cells. The other one went into suspended animation and had no replication of cells until you took the geometry off. Why? Because that created the specific vibration that creates suspended animation. Other vibrations create all types of other functions. Every subtle energy function that exists can be identified and directed through the universal vibrational spectrum. So at the Egyptian National Research Center, when he showed that to the biologists and the chemists and the physicians that were there, they didn't know what to make of it. I have a copy of their research report where they said, we cannot account for this effect with our modern knowledge in science and technology. So they actually created a branch at the Egyptian National Research Center for the study of the effect of geometric forms on life functions. He was the one that identified the centering vibration. Brilliant work and all kinds of different ways that this can be used to design anything or be applied to the human energy field or to balance the energy of land or to transmute detrimental energy from all types of vibrational sources earth energy lines, electromagnetic fields, all kinds of things into something highly beneficial. But what he doesn't focus on because he's focused completely on the centering vibration is he doesn't teach much about or do much research with the 12 bands. So from my perspective, I became very fascinated with the 12 bands. Ibram's done a master work with the centering vibration. But the 12 bands, I felt there was a huge amount of work that was given out by the French that I was finding in the translation project from their text, where they were describing the use of these vibrations in ancient Egypt, in China, in India, in Easter Island, in all kinds of ancient cultures. And their observations in these texts are absolutely stunning for how they knew to generate these vibrations and then project them. They could use it for many things from powerful spiritual activations to profound healing to projecting extremely toxic and deadly vibrations that unless you're trained in an energetic science like Chinese medicine, a Western medical doctor will never even know what happened to the person because they won't see the blockages that it creates. They won't see the, the effects on the energy flows or how it changes the vibratory forces in the body at certain energy centers. So what I wanted to do is, is I wanted to make sure the work with the 12 bands didn't get lost. And so I've been doing work now for years in being able to identify exactly what power is in each of the 12 bands. Every one of these 12 bands is a divine power from the unified source, from the Godhead, from a divine beginning that has to do with all the subtle energies that create life and life functions in the world. These are the subtle energies, the complete spectrum of them. With that, these means that these are all specific divine powers. Each one of the bands has a divine power. So I've spent years in researching in the French text and in many other bodies of work, as well as doing my own research over the last 15 years to identify exactly what power each band has. This then brings us to understanding the powers that are inherent in vibrations for things like vibrational healing, vibrational medicine. And one of the great references that we use today for this is the field of cymatics. Cymatics shows you how sound vibrations shape matter. So for example, if you have powder on a flexible membrane, or you have a liquid or a paste or an oil, or all these things that, not coincidentally, also correspond to certain substances in the human body, and you then apply a vibration to it, then that vibration, as soon as the sound hits the material, the material is free enough to form into a specific shape, a specific mandala like this. And what you see in the cymatics work is that the moment you change the sound vibration, the visible shape changes. And what this means is if you can find the right sound vibration, you can find exactly the sound vibration that will resonate matter to create a specific function, including in living beings. And I want to mention to you that one of the things he discovered is that when you apply the sound vibration, it'll take the two-dimensional surface of the liquid, the paste, the powder, etc., immediately form a perfect mandala. But he found if you take five vibrations and you combine five vibrations together, then you could get the powder on the plate to come together, rise up vertically, and move like a living being.